If I jump and move like that this morning, I probably need the prayer team to come to me. I thank God for our young people, though, who understand. It, it, how, many, how many caught what was going on? I mean, I mean, hey, beginning life without God, going through a bad relationship, and getting to the right relationship with God. Knowing that the next steps of your life are going to work because Jesus is in the middle of it all. I don't know where all my help went. I planned on singing. But I guess they have uh, vacated the building. I guess I'll sing later. Let's just wait. Ain't much you can do when you worship leaders pregnant. You let her do whatever she wants to do. <laughs> Are you glad to be a Christian? Amen. Turn your Bibles with me this morning to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 and Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4. And Matthew 6. Philippians 4, Matthew 6. <clears throat> I kind of just springboard off of what we just seen here is that life is life. And you're not living in a fairy tale. Everyone has their problems and difficulties and their issues and their valleys and their I don't know. I I think sometimes the harder you strive to live for God, the more at times you feel yourself under the gun of Satan. It seems like the more that I pray, the more intense the battle becomes. I mean, it's ever felt like that. I mean, you do the right things and after doing them, you realize that just doing the right thing does not insulate you from the attacks of Satan. Come on, somebody. I think people come to church because they want to be fireproof. Bulletproof. I talk to a lot of people at times and they like, you know, if, if I get Jesus preaching, then everything's going to be all right. Now, no, no. Don't mistake the fact that when you get Jesus, that your troubles, battles, dilemmas, issues are going to go away. It's just the fact when you get Jesus, you have someone who can help you make sense and get you through out on the other side of life through the hurt, the pain, the battles, the valleys, and the situation. I'm just being honest with you. I think sometimes people come to Jesus because they want a fire stick. Get me out. And as soon as they're out, they forget him. Oh, I need some help in here today. They forget God. As soon as that loved one is saved, and as soon as they come out of that trauma, you don't see them in church no more for a while. Well, you were as intense as long as you was in the valley. You was intense of finding answers as long as the pressure was cooking in your life. But as soon as it lit up, you forgot about where your answer comes from. You forgot about the promise you made to praise Him. If you get me out of this valley, I will love you and praise you. I need some help in here today. Now this is what I say. If you coming out of the pressure cooker gets you to forget your responsibility and praise God, I say keep you in there until you learn your responsibility of worshiping and praising and magnifying God. Matter of fact, I believe that's why some people go from one trouble to the next. It's because they don't learn the value they needed to learn if that first go around. So God takes them to the next, not to kill you, but to remind you that they only Him. Hallelujah. And from Him can your help truly come. I will look unto the hill which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. See, we live in a world where everybody wants something done now. Fix me now. And as a representative of God, they can't see him, they see me. They 
think that I can do what he does. Fix me, preacher. I'm broke too. Heal me, preacher. I'm sick too. Hey, can you help me? Well, will you help me? They don't want to hear that. They want somebody to come around and give you their stone. Make it all go away. Make it perfect. And then the walk out without any no with no responsibility and no accountability thereafter. Where there has been much forgiveness, there is much praise. Your responsibility after the storm has cleared is to praise and magnify God. Let's go back. Matter of fact, I think before your storm even intensifies, you should have a praise regimen. You should have a prayer routine. Before you get in the calamity, you should go into it praising, trusting, and magnifying God and trusting His Word. Thus, that guarantees to some degree that you will see safe passage through that, not over it or, or around it, but through it. You pass through the fire. He said, Behold, I, you will not be burned. If you call through the waters, behold, they will not overtake you. He didn't say that you would not pass through the fire. He said, But behold, while you go through, I will be in there with you in the fire. He could extinguish the fire for the Hebrew boys, for them not to be put in there. Easily God could have breathed his breath upon the fire. But he would have not been seen by the world, nor the king that didn't have his eyes on God if he'd have just, just cleared the way, so to speak, and not allowed them to walk in the fire. Oh, the fire has a lot to do with the Christian walk, because through that I am purified. Through that I am justified. Through that in time, I've given my heart even deeper in commitment to him in trust. Through that fire, I find an unseen hand, hallelujah, that is reaching down to me, and I with all the faith that I've got and he leads me out the other side. Amen. See, Christianity is this pill you take and then you wake up in the morning in some kind of dreamland. Christianity is where you come get anointed with oil and all your troubles vanish. That's right. <laughs> Matter of fact, when I became a Christian, the power of Satan come into my mind Intensify. I know you didn't come to hear this this morning, but it's what I got. Because it's where you live. And if the truth is known, you have more battles than you have victories. Am I right? Hey, hey, hey. Make no mistake about it. It ain't the victory that makes the man a woman. It is the battle in which they go through. It is the intensity of that battle. Hey, if it can't kill you, it'll heal you. <laughs> I'm just telling you, when you walk through that valley of the shadow of death, he said, David said, I'll fear no evil. Not because I've got it all together. Not because I understand every scripture. The understanding that David had, I'll fear no evil for that art with me. Hallelujah to his name. Hey, I may not understand it, but I know this. There is a God who is determined season of my life and when I realize he will never leave me and he will never forsake me it doesn't matter what the doctor said, it don't matter what the devil said, it don't matter what your friend said, it don't matter what anybody said, cause when Jesus said that I love you, he meant every single word is this okay See, I, I, you know, I, I am what I am. And then people visited me and talked to me and preached. You've got to just, you know, just, just relax. Calm down. I appreciate your concern. But my heart drives me like that. I hate one of these guys that can stand up here and give you a pretty speech. 
with a monotone voice. There is something inside of me that not only keeps me, but excites me. And I am intense on it to be deposited inside of you all so. Let me preach it. Can I preach? Will you stay long enough to hear what I got to say? Judging by the word, Receive it into your spirit if it's the word of God, not my opinion. Be challenged to walk in it when you leave here. Amen. Don't leave what I'm going to give you on the, on the seat. Amen. My mom used to say when I'd fill my plate up, she said, I don't care how much you get, just eat all. Amen. That's all you'll do. Eat it all. Eat it all. In Matthew, in Matthew chapter 6 and Philippians chapter 4, there is some down to earth, everyday wisdom. From first the Apostle Paul, or from Jesus, and then secondly from the Apostle Paul. I'm about to read you what I believe is the blueprint for everyday living. Matter of fact, I'm going to read you what maybe you don't have highlighted in orange, or yellow, pink. Maybe you don't have no tear stains on these scriptures. Maybe they're so common, they're overlooked. Maybe they're, maybe they're so relative, they're not as spiritual as we feel like they need to be. And we, we, are, we, we, are, we are overdosed on spirituality in America, to some degree. We are either ultra unrighteous, or we so spiritual, we can't get in tune with the rest of the world. Come on, somebody. I mean, we so holy, we can't let nobody touch us. You look at a preacher that ain't like that. I have issues and I have problems and I go through old valleys and I hurt and I have pain. I have to have doctors that oversee my life and carry time. I didn't want that in my life, but it is what it is. But all through that, Jesus has held tight to my hand. And he has seen me through up to this day. And I don't have no reason to believe he's going to abandon me after this morning. Somebody say amen to God. So today I just want to give you some practical Christianity teaching. I want to give you some practical wisdom for everyday living. Because see, here's the thing. Before you can reach that grand plane, you got to stop somewhere. Before you can reach up and touch that holy anointing that everybody is talking about, and hey, and it is there, and oh yeah, there is a secret place in God's presence. But a lot of times before you can kill a Goliath, you got to kill a lion and a bear. Right. So don't jump straight into no fight you can't win. Let's get a few notches on your back and under your belt before you pick a fight with something that's out of your pay grade. Is that all right? Right. But you'll move up. Touch your neighbor and say, you're going to move up. Hallelujah. You're going to move up. Matthew 6, Jesus is talking. He is speaking and preaching some of the greatest words that human ears have ever heard. Amen. And I feel like at times we fail to see what is in here, the treasure and the content which he is unpackaging in these scriptures. And in these words, would you like a little bit of it? Yeah. Like it or not, here it comes. Verse 19, chapter 6. Look at it. Here we go. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust and straw, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in the heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. Here's the key verse. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there is where your heart will be. <laughs> Does anybody need any explanation of what Jesus is trying to say here as a prince? Do not focus all your time with gathering wealth, things of interest and treasures here that we count treasures. Do not busy yourself with those things because there's somebody out there as soon as you and as sure as you gather them together and you love them, they love to take them from you. Don't bother yourself so much 
quit gathering in and providing that wealth for the time laid up. See, the understanding that Jesus is ultimately trying to give them. You may not get to enjoy what you're trying to lay up. Life is very fickle. Simple, but fickle. Unsure at times, uncertain from a human standpoint. Sure, God knows where we are. God has our tomorrows in His hand. God knows our days, our hairs are numbered. Hello, and said the Word of God. Sure, God knows, but guess what? You don't know. And we live our lives every day and should with the expectation of, hey, this could be my last day, but hey, this could be the first day for the rest of my life also. I should do everything like it is my last day, but I should also, by faith, trust God for time out of ours if they do possibly come. Mark Luther said this. He said, when somebody asked him, he said he loved the plant, and especially he loved to plant apple trees. He said, somebody asked him, he said, if you knew that the Lord Jesus was coming tomorrow, what would you do? He said, if I knew that the Lord was coming tomorrow, I'd still plant my apple tree. How do we get it done? That's the kind of life you've got to have, ladies and gentlemen, every day. See, there's some of these uh, spiritual people that have built caves in the mountains, out west, underground cities. They become so spiritual, they quit everything. Sometime back, I remember reading the story, and I just had to laugh. Because I'm like, are people that crazy? Lawyers and doctors. This guy told me, he said, look, I forgot what day it was, September or something. Jesus told me he's coming back. You know what they did? They run all the credit cards to the max. And quit all their jobs. And 24 hours after that, they left. They were more in debt and didn't have no work because they believed some crazy guy who thought he'd heard from Jesus. But nobody knows that day. Somebody say amen. I'm not trying to give you a date. I'm just trying to tell you you need to be ready at any time that he can come. Is that all right? It may be tomorrow, but it may be 2028. I don't know. But I know this according to this Bible. I'm going to prepare myself for his coming. And while I'm waiting to see him, I'm going to live life to the fullest and praise his name and not hide my head in the sand. Jesus says, don't lay up treasures here. Preacher, should I say yes? But not to the point that your heart is down in security fell. He's not concerned about what you have in riches. His concern is riches having you. Because when you've got more than what you need or it's, become, it's, 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 it's got your heart, then if it's got your heart, then there's no room for God. His whole idea here is it's okay to have you can't let that have you Amen. to the point that your heart is there 24-7. Amen. If you stay up at night at 3 o'clock in the morning checking the stock market, it's a pretty good bet you've got too much investment. Because if you would stay up at 3 o'clock in the morning praying, you get more rest because you understand that God can keep what you can't keep. Amen. Help me somebody. Just trying to tell you and give you some everyday wisdom here from the Word of God. He said, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where the thief can't break in and the rust cannot decay those things. Let me ask you something. Have you made a deposit lately up in glory? Has all of your depositing been in federal, security federal, SRP, or Nation Bank, or wherever? I mean, do you drive in there? Would you drive in there right there? Out, baby, and put it in that little tube and set it up. You trust it that they're going to get the numbers right, put it in the right bank account. You go in there and check it. If it ain't, you make sure, hey, let me tell you, when you come in here on Sunday morning, your praise under him is a deposit into his bank account and then to yours in glory. Somebody say amen. Some of y'all ain't made a good deposit in a long time. Oh my God. I 
I feel like preaching this morning. You sit there. Your hand is down by your side. You're mad at your husband. You're mad at your wife. You're mad at God because it didn't turn out like you thought it was going to turn out. Well, it don't never turn out like it's supposed to turn out. All I can tell you is make a deposit and see what happens. Because sooner or later you're going to need a withdrawal. And if you ain't been depositing anything, you're going to be a, <laughs> you're going to be mighty ashamed when you try to cash that check on Sunday morning for healing. If you ain't put some pray and some worship. <laughs> see, everybody wants something out without making no deposit. I want the healing. I just don't want the commitment. I want to be, I want the goodness of God. I just don't want to give my life to Jesus. <laughs> I want to eat the loaves and the fishes, but I don't want to follow him like everybody else does. Is this all right? I know for my first son in the back in a while, this was strong, but hey. This is reality. That's why people don't come to church. They think they don't like the air conditioning, the color of the carpet, and the music. It's just the fact they got a commitment problem. Right. They have a following issue. Yeah, I'm all right. Following Jesus thing is a little strange. It's a little different. But if I follow him, then that means I've got to give up my rights. Lord God knows we love our rights as human beings. Amen. And if I follow Jesus, that means I've got to give him something. And not just my praise, my worship, my life. I've got to give him my resources. That means my finances. Right. Mm. And I don't know if I can walk down that road. But when you hollering out, Oh God, heal my son and my doubt. You don't mind giving the request in. And all God has demanded is that you follow him. Follow him. Jesus has given them good everyday wisdom here on how to live. Well, you treasure your together. Where your heart is, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Where's your heart is? While I've been preaching, where's your heart? While I've been preaching, what you've been thinking about? I mean, while I've been talking and preaching the gospel, have you been thinking about something other than God? Who you are? that the people can sit in church and think of and, and, and think about somebody else beside their mate. Oh, Being preached to and the Holy Ghost is moving and you got thoughts in your head of food and rain. Oh man, it's tight but right in here today. We can sit in church and think about We can rip them off and I'm not paying taxes. Oh, oh it's quiet in here today. Sit right in the middle of a God time with, with, with God present to touch us and hear the word and the mind, the carnal mind, is constantly turning out the pleasures of life and showing you visions uh, uh, of what you think is victory, but it's only pain. Suffering down the road. The heart is not here. It is where our treasure. Where's your heart? Where's your treasure? Well, if your treasure, you're gonna find your heart. If your treasure is Jesus, 
then that's where your heart will be. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Somebody say, move well, on, preacher. I am. But I'm going from bad to worse now. Uh, verse 22. The lamp of the body is out. Hold on. Before I go to the second one, let's, let me just tell you what to write out inside this scripture. I wrote this out. I wrote this out last night late. I wrote it out in my Bible. I want you to write it out next to your on a piece of paper. If you don't want to go out in your Bible, don't write it in. But write it out somewhere. I've got to refocus my heart. I got to refocus my heart. Verse 22. The lamp of the eye of the body. Or the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body is, will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light is, that is in you is darkness, how great, how great is that darkness. Jesus is talking about not only physical, physical, but tied it into the spiritual vision of our life. Say this with me. I've got to refocus my vision. All right, I, I, if I've got to refocus my heart, then I've got to refocus my vision, what I'm looking at, what I'm focused on. What are you looking at? What is the thing that attracts you to gaze into it until it becomes an object in which you pour time and money a relationship that is not fit. Matter of fact, if you gaze too much at one thing that is not godly or righteous, I dare say it will become a god before too long. Right. It will become an idol. And God said, I have no other god before me. That's right. He said, I am a jealous god. That's right. So you're dealing with a problem then. Because God is already on the outs because you have Somebody or something has taken his place. That's right, amen. Got to refocus. Church is about refocus. Amen. Hey, look here. You ever had your computer jam up, get slow, something happened? Hey, we don't. I don't go on that technical stuff. I got a, 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 an IT guy to come by here, work on my computers, and he'll tell me stuff, and I'm looking at him like, huh? This how you do it, huh? Push these three things, four fingers like this right here, hit this button there. Like, man, I'll tell you that. You know what I need? Mean? Where is the refresh button? There you go. Amen. You see, the whole thing about life is if the truth be known, we come in on Sunday morning looking for the refresh button. Because our life has got jammed up like our computers at times. It's downloading too much information. It's become lethargic and slow. I've listened to my friends always tell me how bad I am. I've listened to my mama put me down. And my daddy and my wife and my husband and my boss and the devil. And I'm dragging. Because you downloaded on it. You accepted it. You just downloaded it. It's inside. See, when you come to church, you got to say, Holy Ghost, get that refresh button over there. And let me just get discarded and get rid of all this trash and this hellish virus that is running through my mind and in my spirit. Because I ain't about to die. I'm about to leave. I ain't about to go down. I'm about to get up. Hallelujah to God. I ain't going to die. I'm going to be well. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Refocus. Refocus. What are you looking at? The mountain of God. Valley of Jesus. Say the Lord. The Savior. Look up to me, he said, and me. Like years ago, I preached a message where Moses had made the servant of brass in the wilderness. 
And as I was getting that together, God spoke me thundered in my spirit. He said, there is Christ for a glance and life for a look. And I remember I preached the message entitled Grace for a glance and life for a look. Let me tell you, he said, all you got to do is look. Just fix your eyes upon it. And the serpent's bite and the poison that is in your system will begin to drain out and feed away. And you will live. Just look at it. Come on, somebody. Just look at it. And Jesus took it up and took it to the next level. He said, and his bones is lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So shall I be lifted up. Oh, my God. And I will draw all me, oh my God. If we just would turn as the song says, our eyes upon Jesus and look full into his wonderful face, then the things of this world will grow strangely dim and the light of the glory and grace. Look at him this morning. Take your eyes off of your family and your problem and your distress and your depression. When I leave that doctor's office, she'll tell me at times, mm. I went in that hospital the other day, that lady felt my leg on the right. She said, you know you got a disease in this look. I said, I didn't know that. She said, yeah, it's called suckiness. Your, your arteries and your legs are hard and I can't hardly feel a pulse in your foot. She says, because you got that disease in your heart. Man. It's like I know that I got happy. And I started rejoicing. And little nurse said, you something else, ain't you? I said, you got that right. I said, you know you got that right because I could lay here and examine the words you just told me. And look at that thing and what you just said in conjunction with what I'm going through. And I can lay here and accept the fact, yeah, I may be dying. My God, I'm dying, but I'm dying to live. And the whole thing is, I know this. My life ain't in a team's hands that's right across that hallway in the open heart center. My life and my existence is not in the hand of some doctor or some radiologist or some my life is in the hand of a man who's got nail scars in it. Hallelujah. And the day that I can't trust him, I'd rather leave here nearly half. But it's so as I'm laying on this bed, there's a God who knows my name and he knows where I'm at and he knows how to heal me. So she goes in. Hey, in my thoughts, they already got juiced up with that car stuff. I'm thinking as I'm going in, oh God, here comes the students. They marching in like saints marching in the church. Here come the students. Here come the balloons. Here come this. I heard the devil say, open heart church. Won't be long, Jack. Open heart church. Can I get an aim? I'm sitting there like, oh God. See, it, it doesn't matter how much Holy Ghost you got, how, how sanctified you think you are. That devil will come around every once in a while and try to build a nest in your head. Try to put doubt and unbelief and discouragement against God's word and faith in your mind. Somebody say amen. Am I preaching to anybody here today? Is this helping anybody in this room? Maybe I need to buy a CD in this message. Hallelujah, my God. And I laid there and I said, oh God, I'm in your hand. I told my wife before I went in, I said, baby, I said, I want to tell you. I said, I know and I believe everything is going to be all right. She said, it's going to be all right. I said, I believe that. I said, if I've been in the bedside when people said that, it wasn't all right. 30 minutes later, everything was gone. Things were different, changed. I said, but I want you to know this. I said, I love you with the love I've got in you. If the day is my day, I want you to know I've been in his care and in his hands for 30 years of my life. Ever since I've been, I've called his name out 
He's been my Savior and my God. I've not cheated on her. I've not lusted after anything else. When I got turned on to Jesus, hallelujah, I got turned on to my answer. But you hearing me here today? That didn't mean that I hadn't failed him. That didn't mean that I had the time to so disobedient. It doesn't mean that I've always walked straight as I'd like to. But I'll tell you this. When I couldn't reach up high enough, he can reach down further. That I can reach up. Can I give an amen from somebody that understands the value of his love and keep it great? Hallelujah. I told her, I said, if I don't get to come back out here, you just know I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith that I finished the course I feel like he's given me to finish. But if he lets me live, I'm going to preach like a crazy man. I'm going to add virtue to this and that knowledge. Hallelujah, I'm going to build upon the wall and the rest of the time that he's given me. Somebody say amen. We can't go back. All we got ahead of us is, is victory. Somebody shout yes. Hallelujah to God. Jesus said you got to refocus your eye. I had to refocus it right there in the bed. I'm not dependent on them. Well, she went in. You don't want to know what the news was? She come back out. And see, this is, I've been progressively getting worse in my heart. Blockages have been coming. It's been plaque build up. Cholesterol, this and that. I've been used to hearing that. But she goes in this time. She comes back out. She said, there is no more plaque build up. There's no more plaque build up. There's no blockages in his heart. He said, son, I just opened up the other ones a little bit just for the sake of opening them up. But then I said, hey, hallelujah. God, you know how? I said, God, you know how? I said, God, you know how? Anybody ever been to heal? Shout hallelujah. Oh, yes. Praise his name. I have to, you have to refocus. Refocus where you are. No one can serve two masters, 24 says. For he will hate the one and love the other. Else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is riches. Mammon is money. You can't, you cannot have them two gods in your life roaming around. They'll kill you if you do. This ain't just the love of money. It's the, it's the pride of life. It's the love of the world. We don't hear these scriptures preached no more. Where it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Love not the world, neither the things that are in it. Hey, enjoy them. Participate in them. Yeah, buy one. I don't care. But don't let your heart be wound swoon to the point that you begin to love it and adore it. Because God becomes jealous. Somebody say amen. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. Oh, yeah. That's what I come by to tell you. Amen. Your total allegiance belongs to God. Amen. If you'll give God what's right, you'll give God His place. If you'll worship God and praise God, your parking lot, hey, your, 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 your driveway will be full of cars. Y'all can hear that. <laughs> if you'll do what's right and you'll praise Him and bless Him with what He's given, my God, he'll make sure that everybody and your milk, your milk is in your refrigerator. You got bread in your cupboard. You got, hey, you just didn't get the off brand, but you got cocoa pellets today, baby. How they look you to God. You didn't get the Kroger brand. He did get cherry on Hallelujah to his name. That may sound simple. It may sound childish, but it is the fact. It is the fact. You can't serve. Refocus your vision. The third one here. Jesus says you need to refocus who you serve. For he is serving. Who are you serving? Refocus. Refocus. This morning, this service is about refocus. I wrote three things to come into church this morning. I put down refresh, refocus, rejoice. Before we can rejoice, you need to refocus. You're about to get refreshed. 
then you're going to rejoice. Before you can enjoy rejoicing, you have to refocus. Put priorities in the right place. Amen. Jesus where he needs to be. Here's the place I really want to go. Here's the subject in which I have painstakingly waited through the rest of my comments to get to. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Somebody shout out worry. Mm, the biggest killer in the world. It trumps heart trouble, should it I be you. It trumps every disease, cancer included. Worry is the number one killer of men and women. It is responsible for most of our sicknesses and ailments that we are involved in now. <laughs> what you will eat, don't worry about what you will eat. You will drink. Don't worry about your body. What you will put on. Is not light more than food? And the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap. They don't gather in barns, Jesus said. Get your head on the Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you by worry? He's asking you here this morning. Which of you by worry can add one cubit to your stature? Can you grow faster, greater by worry? So why do you worry, Jesus said, about clothing and consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet they, yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Huh. Now when God so clothed the grass of the field which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Touch your neighbor and say, why are you worried? <laughs> Therefore, do not worry. He says it again, time and time and time again in this discourse of sermon. He said, do not worry. Why are you worried? Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. Do, not worry. do you know what the world is doing right now? They're worried. The millionaire is worried about somebody stealing his millions. The stockbrokers are worried about the stock market crash. The Arabs are worried about the oil dropping again. Come on, somebody. The apocalypse people are worried about the world coming to an end. And they ain't got enough fresh water to drink. Let me tell you right now. I'm convinced of this. When you trust God and you believe God, Hallelujah. If God can take care of the birds, he said, and take care of the flowers and clothe them, let me tell you, I'm all about, hey, listen, I'm not trying to be so crazy that I, I'm not in my mind thinking about those things. I, I, do, I do look at that, and I do ponder upon it, but I don't worry about it. Let me tell you right now, oh, my God, let me tell you, if he can take care of of all the things he said, listen to me, he can cause a spring to come up in your backyard when you're not even ready for it and a pool of water to just come. He can cause somebody to stop a, a, a van, a bread van in your neighborhood and give you all the bread you need so that you can eat. Oh my God, are you hearing me here today? Amen. Our lives are consistently tangled in the trap of water. Do you know that they say 90% of what we worry about never happens anyhow? It never takes place. Our kids worry about going back to school. They're going to fit in. They're going to be in the in crowd. If this girl likes me or that boy likes me, they, they go to the hospital just like everybody else. Their stomachs are in or not. I've seen them young teenagers. They have ulcers deep inside. And the whole thing is they're trying to fit in. They're trying to find their place. And they feel intimidated. And anxiety kicks in. And they worry. They worry while they're asleep. 
asleep in their subconscious. They worry while they're awake. And every day they get up, they worry. Some of you go to work and you can't work on your job because you're too busy worrying about what's not on your job. You, you, are, you are falling behind in production because your mind is somewhere else about the devil's got it hooked like a hook and he's brought it into his world of fear and doubt and unbelief and worry. Why don't you cut the line and tell him no. I'm a child of God. I belong to Jesus and I shall not, I will not worry about looking around and some of you ain't took your hand off the seat since I've been preaching. I'm about to walk around this room. I'm going to give somebody the mic and say finish my son. Reach. Boy, y'all look. I can feel you there. Oh, snap. I ain't no preacher. He better not come back here. Bless God. He come back here. It's going to be on like donkey Kong then. If he come back here and gives me the microphone. I'm telling you what Jesus said. I'm just trying to encourage you. The quick word. Add it to the mountain the difficulties in your life. That you don't even need that know how. You've got enough problems as they are. I do too. Without adding worry to the mix. Worry ain't nothing but it is the hellish cocktail from hell itself. When you mix worry in with your life, everything goes crazy. You wouldn't believe the people live their life like that. Oh God. Oh God. I can't go to work today. I'll leave my wife here. Oh my God. I can't trust her. Oh my God. My neighbor might come home while I'm in work. You can't go out of there. Oh my God. What am I going to do? I'll be here all night. Oh my God, they'll come kill me. Why would they target you? That's what I asked. Why would they target you? When we come in my office one day, she said, Oh my God, Bridget and Devil trying to kill me. Why? I just got to say, Who are you? What do you do? She said, When I work over here in this factory, I said, Do you preach? No. Do you pray a lot? No. Are you an intercessor? No. Why? Got to sell up the bills. 
Then Taco Bell comes on. Don't you want this big old fat habanero burrito? Then a Bud Light commercial comes on, old and built, skinny, weightlifted folks drinking. <laughs> Ride jet ski. We sit there and tell ourselves, man, I need a new container coat. I mean, hey, get in the car. We got to go Taco Bell. They got that big old primo thing going on down there. And, oh, my God, that Bud Light looking good. We can, we can drink one of them with the taco or with the burrito. And if it ain't that, it was a Coca-Cola. They make that thing look so good. That glass is cold and it'll run down the outside of <laughs> Don't tell me you ain't ever been sitting in your chair full as a tick. You can't put nothing else in you and see a commercial about a pie or a piece of cake and then get right up. Walk to your refrigerator and say, my God, I shouldn't have seen that thing. I've got to find me some sweet up in this place. Hey, we ain't got no cake in here. Am I right? Right. And we find out that our whole lives have been dictated by what somebody else is telling us that we need. Somebody say amen. amen. They tell us, oh, you need to be changing clothes. When your closet is slap full of what you ain't even put on yet. Amen. You need a new pair of shoes. Well, if you find you another rack, because all of them you have is full of shoes. Somebody say amen. Well, you need a ham in your refrigerator. Yeah, right after you eat all that turkey, that's right down there on the left. Right We're constantly bombarded. What you gonna eat, what you gonna drink, what you gonna play. And if there's three things Satan tells us all the time to get our lust, and I ain't talking about the opposite say there's a lot of things you can lust after without it being immoral. We look at lust as being one side. It's wrong to be lusting out the food when you don't. Right. It's a word for it called gluttony. Boy, you ain't heard that word since 1973 at the county. We don't talk about gluttony in America because we eat ourselves to death. We can't have a church function without a donut swimming around in a room somewhere. We can't have a meat without somebody saying, hey, I'll bring the cookies. Hey, I got I got the Coca-Cola. Yeah, I'll bring that big old piggy and pie that my grandma made. I didn't eat one piece and I'll bring it. Next thing you know, it's a gluttony party. Right. What we come to church to do? Oh my God, I don't know what this big and pie to die for. <laughs> well, we come to pray. Well, hold on a minute. Right. In this last five Okay. Alright, Jesus, where was we? Lord, if you could just Open up the windows of heaven and bless us. Well, he's still done that. Amen. 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 How much pinky and pie do you want? <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. How much drink can you drink? How much rice can you eat? How many hams can you put in your refrigerator? Amen. Right. Amen. See, this stuff tells me to preach. But it's the truth. We spend our every waking moment worrying about things to wear, put on, digest, ride around in, live in. If that ain't good enough, this is level two. If we're not concerned about them things, we're concerned about what other people are concerned about us. Right. What do they think about me when I have? Yes. Maybe get my neck that day. What do what is my neighbor thinking about my new kid? 
What is my neighbor thinking about my house? And how I cut the grass and how I trim the roses and how I we spend our life worrying about what they think. Am I wrong? Wives, I've seen them worry themselves to death because they're intimidated by their husband and should love them like Christ loved the church. But they put so much pressure on them. It's almost like they're, they got to perform and when their husband walks it out. Can you me? I love it. I love it. They take advantage of you. Right. The relationship is also down the spot. It's no longer a woman and a man that's in love with one another. It's a man with a slave. Uh-huh. Right. Come on, help me somebody. Hey, you thought y'all ladies gonna get off the hook? No way, shape, form, or fashion. Well, I dare let you off right now and build this song. And if there is a creature on God's plan that can hook a man in the jaw and reel that book up in, it is a warm man. Right. They'll make you do things you swore to your buddies you would never do. Bless God, I guarantee you she's going to wash my clothes. What they don't see is you in that bedroom seat. I'll get this stuff out. That's all right, baby. You, that's all right. You sit in there. And I know we may have some young ears in here, but I'm going to go say it anyhow. And I won't be graphic. But you'll get what I'm saying. Because I'm old enough to do this. <laughs> See, women have this ability to say things like this. Huh. Now, you you got to get that done. and You need to go ahead and, and, and cut that grass and, and, and fix that and, and buy that and get all that done now. And you know if you, if, if you don't get that stuff done, <laughs> do I need to say it anymore? And you know what we do? Yeah, baby. <laughs> Let me tell you right now, that right there, according to the Word of God, is almost like witchcraft because it's control. <laughs> and here's the thing. Can I teach you a little bit here? Oh, while we're on relationships, let me just say this. When you marry wife, you're, that's not your body. You, 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 don't have, you don't have the ability to say, ha ha, uh, when I get ready. Now, that ain't how the Bible says it. You have to show true benevolence to your husband and your husband to you. Now, if he's weak in that area, don't make him maintain some kind of longevity of track. I done seen that too many times. Boy, some of y'all faces, if I had a shot. <laughs> some of y'all went from. I had that deer in the headlight look. But am I telling you the truth? And the Bible tells us when you fast, if you decide to be part for during that fasting. Don't let it be for a long period of time unless you attempt it. That's what the book says. Am I right? That's not an option. I don't know how I got there. But I'm there. Have your way with
He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Will you lay your hand right there in that Bible? Close your eyes and say, Jesus, today I will submit to this word and I will not worry about what I cannot control. As a matter of fact, I won't worry about the things I can control. I just want to obey you, worship you, and please you. And you will take care of what I cannot in Jesus' mighty name. In yeah. Jesus. Six things I want you to write them down quick. I ain't gonna speak on them. I just thoughts. Six thoughts. Here we go. Worry indicates a defective value system in your life. Worry indicates a defective self-image. What do you mean? You are more valuable than the birds or the flowers. You are the most prized possession that God has. Hallelujah. He wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. Worry indicates a defective way of thinking. Anxiety. You can't add or take away one inch of who you are. Worry indicates trust in God. If you worry about something, you are not trusting God about that something. Oh, ye of little faith. Worry indicates a defective purpose in life. He'll take care of the things that are most important to us. Don't worry. Lastly, anxiety indicates a defective view of tomorrow. Jesus said, just deal with the issues today. Let tomorrow worry about itself. Do you know what most of our worries and concerns are in? Tomorrow. What will happen tomorrow? Where will I be? What will they say to me on my job? They may tell you what they told you last month. Great job. Right. But see, Satan says, they're going to say, you out of You gone. What God planned, though, is you're doing a good job of it. And we recognize that. So if you do think about tomorrow, know this, God is already in it. Before you get there. He's already decided. Not tomorrow. Before I even walk through the door. I heard a little story. I always say a little story. That's just my way. True little story about a woman whose name is Rosalind Goforth. She was a veteran missionary to China years ago. She wrote a little book. It's called How I Know God Answers Prayer. Her name is Rosalind Goforth. If you ever get one, find it. Buy it. Please for me and give it to me. How I Know God Answers Prayer. In that book, she tells a story when she was a little girl. She said Easter Sunday came one year during a warm springtime. And everyone had put their winter clothes away. Rosalind had no Easter dress. She decided, she said, rather to stay home than to wear her old winter dress. Going to her room, she opened her Bible and her eyes rested on Matthew 6, 32. It was if God spoke to me directly, she said. She said, why worry about your clothes? Seek my kingdom first. She said she put on her old dress and fall off the feeling of humiliation. 
And as she went to church, the Easter message touched her heart deeply, she said. The next day, a box arrived from a distant heart containing not only new dresses, she said, but many other things as well. Hey, the secret, she said, was seeking God first and putting God first. Hey, look what I came with this morning. It may not be the top of the line that may have passed the offer or dinner or some fancy place in the mall. Hey, matter of fact, what I got on, some of it might even come from the goodwill if I look at it real close. Amen. I'm not ashamed to tell you that. My God, I'm not some fancy fancy person. It's all right. I, I, I've outgrown the idea of clothing and what I look like and what and, and what people think my appearance should be. I dress good. I try to keep my hair cut. Everything else. But this woman understood a value principle that you need to have this morning that, hey, it ain't about what you wear and if people judge you in a church because of what you drive up into the parking lot in and what you wear through the foyer and get into the sanctuary that is a possibility you're in a carnal building where God needs to really be clothed. You're being judged by what you wear and where you eat and where you live and what you drive. Then we're not spiritual as we should be and we're not as Christian as God's intending us to be. Somebody say amen. But I came in here this morning and whatever you got on is all right with me and I can tell you it's all right with God. Hallelujah. He said seek the kingdom first and all these other things shall, 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 shall be added unto you. What do you mean? We spent a lot Oh, I'm going to finish with this thought. We spent a lot of time praying, God, give me more clothes. Give me more money. Give me more houses and land. Give me another job. Give me something else. Here's what Jesus is saying. If you'll come to my house, if you'll seek my kingdom first and its righteousness, put all your wants aside. Put all your desires aside. Put your list down for a minute. And don't approach him like that. Just approach him with the idea, Lord, I love you if I ain't got nothing. I love you if I've got everything. I love you if I've got a VW to drive. I love you if I drive a Mercedes Benz. Can I get some help in here today? I'll drive you with a Honda. I, I love you with a Honda. I love you with an Acura. I love you with a Nissan. I love you, hallelujah, with a Lexus. Because it doesn't matter. Because Jesus is the priority of my life. And I won't worry. Get this. Here, here, here. The revelation. Come here, Hallelujah. You can, you, can, you, can, you can do it better than I can preach. Right up here. Get in on your knees, just like you was while ago. Just like that. There you go. Now I want you to look up in the heavens like you was doing. And I just want you to love Him. Just love Him. Not ask Him, just love Him. Just love Him. Just look up there and love Him for Him. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Just keep, don't look at me, just keep doing it. They're watching you and listening to me. Here's the whole thing. While she's seeking the key, loving on Jesus, he's getting the care package together. Right. Now she ain't praying for cars, land, houses, and money. No, she's loving me. But because she's, I'm number one, I'm going to send a care gift right. from heaven her way. Why she's loving on me? Somebody's putting an extra hundred dollars in a bank account for her later. Y'all ain't hearing this. While she's living on me, I'm going to make a call pay. While she's living on me, I'm going to give her the desires of her heart. While she's living on me, yes, yeah, she'll find that apartment, that, 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 that price she needs to find it. And while she's living on me, I'm going to open that door and that job for her that, that, that can really bless her. So I know she's going to bless me. Once she gets blessed, she's going to reciprocate that back to me. Somebody say amen. Here's the thing. She ain't seeking the things. She's seeking God that gives the things. And when you seek God, not the things, God says, I'll send you a care package by way of the Holy Ghost to your life. And that that you didn't even have to ask for, I'm going to give it to you. Because if you seek the King of Earth, He said, oh, oh, somebody shout, oh. All these other things shall be. Somebody shout it. How often we pray for things. 
our whole prayer life, if I dare say, we spent a hundred words talking to God, 75 of them is, can I have one of them? How about that? Can you do this? Can I get one of those? What about that? When if the truth is known, prayer is an 